There's no doubt in my mind this is probably one of the most intelligent bacteria on the planet. In fact, it has three times more DNA than any of its closest relatives, which would be chlamydia and ammonia. Um, this organism knows how to evade the immune system. It knows how to hide inside cells. Um, it has decoy mechanisms to protect itself from the immune system. It knows how to shift its outer surface proteins, so it fools the immune system in finding it. Uh, it's a very clever bacteria. So there definitely is an intelligence to this bacteria. It's been around for millions of years. They discovered it in amber specimens actually years ago. Um, and an Otzi, who was the Neanderthal man, who was found in Tyrolia. So the bacteria has been around for a long time, but I don't think people have recognized the full clinical manifestations um, of causing fatigue and arthritis and memory problems, yet the bacteria has been around for quite a long time. Well, like any new disease, there are always two camps um, who debate the existence of a disease and how to diagnose and treat it. And in this case, the two camps are the Infectious Disease Society of America and ILADS, the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society, of which I was one of the founding members. So when Lyme was discovered approximately 40, 45 years ago in Lyme, Connecticut by Dr. Alan Steer, he's a rheumatologist and he did an excellent job discovering the bacteria. But he thought because people failed one or two weeks of antibiotics that it was an autoimmune disease. And then the infectious disease doctors got a hold of it and there was funding from the NIH uh, that they got on this and they also felt that it was mainly autoimmune or they just didn't understand why people stayed chronically ill. So over time the debate has developed where we now know in fact that the blood tests to diagnose this disease are very unreliable. Um, we miss approximately half the patients. It's like a coin flip using the standard test of an ELISA. Um, one of the tests in Europe that's also used in the US called the C6 ELISA. It's a bit better because it also checks for European strains. So there are 100 strains of Lyme disease in the United States and 300 strains worldwide. And in Europe, Borrelia abzelii and Borrelia gerinii are two of the major forms of Borrelia that exist in Europe. And abzelii causes a skin rash called acrodermatitis, chronic amyotrophic hands. It's a violaceous skin rash of the hands and feet. And Borrelia gerinii causes neuroborreliosis or neurological problems with Lyme. This new test, the C6 ELISA, will pick up these other strains of Lyme. So a lot of the doctors, when they don't find it, they're using an outdated form of an ELISA. It is much better, in my opinion, to use the C6 ELISA and to also use a Western blot with a laboratory that looks at several different strains of Lyme. It, it's become a taboo subject because there's a political aspect to this disease. It's not just a medical disease. Uh, so for example, in the United States, doctor's licenses have been taken away for diagnosing and treating this. Medical boards have come after doctors. Uh, fortunately, in New York State, where I practice, the governor signed a bill about two years ago protecting doctors in New York State for diagnosing and treating it. There are other states that have followed. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, in Europe, for example, in France, I know doctors who've had their license taken away. Um, and many doctors are scared to treat this disease because European governments and uh, many other governments, Australia, they're using CDC guidelines. And the problem is, is that the CDC said on their website that Lyme disease is a clinical diagnosis. You're only supposed to use the test for making a clinical diagnosis, but the insurance companies took this definition and they told doctors this was the only way to diagnose it. So many doctors are thrown out of insurance companies for not following the insurance company guidelines. Um, there are conflicts of interest of some of the members of the Infectious Disease Society of America. Uh, some of them do make money from some of the Lyme tests. Um, and they've been getting funds from the NIH for quite a long period of time to hold their same viewpoint, which is that it's an autoimmune phenomenon, uh, there's damage to the body, or we just don't know why people are sick. Except in the middle of a number one worldwide spreading epidemic, it's just not acceptable to say, we don't know why these people are staying ill. So in 2013, the CDC revised their estimates, and they said that there was a tenfold increase in the number of Lyme cases from 30,000 to over 300,000 cases a year. However, we know that they are not counting uh, the people who have been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, which is 3.5% of the American population, fibromyalgia, which is 1.5% of the American population. So there alone you're dealing with millions of people that may have Lyme disease because the way you make the diagnosis of chronic fatigue and fibro is someone who's tired, they have aches and pains, they have sleep disorders, they have memory problems, and their autonomic nervous system 
the part of their nervous system that controls the blood pressure is thrown off. Well, you see that with chronic fatigue, with fibro, and with Lyme. So the numbers, I think, are grossly underestimated. I suspect there's probably at least one to two million people a year getting Lyme disease in the United States. Uh, the World Health Organization has shown that there's millions of people across, especially uh, Western Europe, that are getting Lyme disease um, in the Balkan countries. And we know in China that up to 6% of the Chinese population has had and been exposed to Lyme. And I know that because I met with the head of the CDC in China. Uh, the Chinese government invited me over as a consultant and told me privately that those were the numbers, which would mean 6% uh, of 1.4 billion people. Uh, you're dealing with 50, 60 million people. You're dealing with huge numbers of people who have Lyme disease. In 2015, the CDC then revised the estimates and said that there was a 320% increase in the number of counties affected in the United States, that it was spreading in all directions. So because the blood tests are unreliable, um, the ELISA will only pick up approximately half the people. And the fact that the insurance companies have adopted the ELISA followed by a Western blood, which is what the CDC uses to epidemiologically screen large numbers of people, we find that the insurance companies are not really adequately diagnosing these people. Um, and therefore, instead of getting to the source of the illness, they're just allowing their doctors to give these people medication to treat their pain. Uh, they may take Aricep patches and Nemenda for their memory problems. They may take uh, anti-inflammatory medicines and Neurontin for their neuropathy and their pain, but they're not getting to the underlying source. And I suspect that they think they may be saving money um, doing this because the insurance companies at this point are suffering in the United States. Um, our healthcare system is certainly in disarray at this point. Um, and I think that we do need a, an overhaul of the way we do practice chronic disease medicine. But I do think the insurance companies um, they know there are two guidelines for treating Lyme, and they have chosen the guideline that basically says that very few people get this disease and need to be treated. So um, I think that needs to be addressed um, from a political issue, and hopefully the 21st Century Cure Act got passed in Congress just this past year. Hopefully we will have better answers for Lyme, uh, which the insurance companies will adapt in the next couple of years. Doctors need to be aware of this disease because it is going to affect the future generations of America. For example, mothers can transmit Lyme disease as well as other tick-borne infections like Babesia, um, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Bartonella. These can all be transmitted to the fetus. And I know for a fact that OBGYNs generally are not screening women for Lyme disease and tick-borne disorders before they get pregnant. If they would use the questionnaire that's in my book as a simple screening tool, they would see that these women have a multi-systemic illness. They're tired, they're achy, they have a headache. The key to Lyme disease, however, is migratory pain, migratory joint pain, migratory muscle pain, migratory nerve pain. If OBGYNs were to ask these questions, they'd be able to see if a woman about to get pregnant has Lyme, or a psychiatrist who has a patient come in and say, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I have obsessive compulsive disorder, I'm schizophrenic. Lyme causes every neuropsychiatric manifestation that psychiatrists see. A psychiatrist would want to hand out this questionnaire to see if they have a multi-systemic disorder. So because Lyme will affect the heart, the cardiologists need to be looking into it, right? There, we had a young man in Poughkeepsie years ago who came back from Rhode Island and he had a flu-like illness. The doctor checked him for Lyme. The test was negative and he died three weeks later from Lyme carditis. There's definitely an urgency to diagnose this disease because if you can get it within the first 30 days, you can cure it. So we know that 75 to 80 percent of the people, if they happen to see the bullseye rash, and by the way, half of the rashes look like bullseyes, and half of the rashes are solid spreading rashes, but 50 percent of the people or more, at least in the United States, do not get the rash. But if you do find the rash or see a tick bite and get sick, and you treat it, for example, with doxycycline or ceftin in the first 30 days, you can cure it. However, those people who are not so lucky, who go past 30 days, those are usually the ones who come to my medical practice, who have long-term problems. They've been to 10 to 20 doctors looking for answers. And by the time they come to see me, many of them are disabled. So it's very important that people follow a sugar-free, uh, yeast-free diet, because when you're giving antibiotics, you can affect an overgrowth of yeast in the colon and also could cause diarrhea. So the first thing we do is we tell people to stay off all sugar. Uh, many of them do well off gluten. You have to check if they have food sensitivities. Because the thing about Lyme disease is the symptoms of Lyme disease are due to inflammation in the body. There are molecules called inflammatory cytokines, uh, TNF-alpha, IL-1, IL-6, interferon gamma. 
these are the molecules that cause people to be sick with Lyme. If you have food allergies, like if you're sensitive to gluten or if you're allergic to dairy or wheat, you're gonna get the same inflammatory molecules produced just like you do with Lyme. So in the 16 point MSIDS model that I use, eight out of the 16 points cause inflammation. So these people have to get to sleep. If you don't get to sleep at night, you have too much inflammation, too much interleukin-6 is produced. If you're eating the wrong foods, right? If you have the wrong bacteria in the microbiome of your gut, you can have inflammation. If you're mineral deficient, like zinc deficiency, will cause increased inflammation in the body. So we give high dose probiotics, over 300 billion of good quality probiotics with Saccharomyces boulardii to stop C. diff diarrhea. Um, we have people on a regular exercise program, getting them to sleep. And then we use things like low dose naltrexone. Low dose naltrexone has been published in the medical literature for multiple sclerosis, for Crohn's disease, for fibromyalgia, and we've used it in over a thousand people with Lyme, and we find it to be very effective. In fact, my wife is still on LDN after getting over Lyme disease, and she finds it to be very, very useful. The reason LDN works, and the reason we use nutritional supplements with LDN, is LDN will block certain cells in the brain called microglial cells. These are these small glial cells in the brain that cause inflammation. And those are the cells that have been responsible for the manifestations of Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative disorders. They're the same cells that cause inflammation in patients with Lyme disease. So LDN will shut down this microglial proliferation of making cytokines. It helps to shift some of the cytokine formation in the body. So there's less tumor necrosis factor alpha, less interleukin-6. And the way it does this is there is a switch inside the nucleus of the cells called NF-kappa B. So if you can shut off this switch inside your cells called NF-kappa B, which LDN does, and other things that do it, for example, are nutritional supplements like curcumin, green tea extract, broccoli seed extract, resveratrol. These are the four supplements that we use with LDN that tell this particular switch inside the nucleus to turn off, shuts down the production of these inflammatory molecules, and people feel tremendously better. So LDN and using these nutritional supplements to help decrease the inflammatory response is part of the regular protocol that we use for people who are chronically ill with Lyme disease.